Welcome back to the RSET training, Agricultural Crop Classification with Synthetic Aperture Radar and Optical Remote Sensing. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm a scientific analyst at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and a trainer with the RSET program. Last week, we learned from Heather McNairn about the basics of radar remote sensing and its applications to agriculture. We also learned how Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uses both synthetic aperture radar and optical data operationally to produce Canada's annual crop inventory. In the second part of this five-part training, you'll receive a short refresher on optical remote sensing from Fabrizio Romino and Magdalena Fitrick from the European Space Agency and learn how to process Sentinel data using the Sentinel application platform. As a reminder, this training includes a total of five two and a half hour sessions on consecutive two day, Tuesdays and Thursdays from October 5th to October 19th. The same content will be presented two different times each day. Session A will be presented in English and session B presented in Spanish. All the training materials for the webinar series, including slides, video recordings, and homework can be found at the link provided on the right of the slide. There will be one homework assignment posted to the training page on the last day of the webinar series. Answers must be submitted by Google form by the due date of November 2nd. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of November 2nd you will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. I'll now pass it over to Fabrizio from the European Space Agency for a refresher on optical remote sensing. Welcome everybody. My name is Fabrizio Ramoino. I work in ISA Esrin since 2011 as optical and thermal data exploitation expert. Together with Magdalena Ficic, we would like to present you a short refresher of optical remote sensing data and processing Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3 data using uh, ISA SNAP software in order to retrieve biophysical variables and radiometric indices for vegetation monitoring. This webinar is the second one in the series of five webinars. And as I briefly described it before, during this webinar, we will introduce you to optical remote sensing, optical data pre-processing and processing, as well as to SNAP software. At the end of October, you will participate in another webinar, which is a continuation of our webinar. And this focuses on biophysical variables retrieval using optical imagery to support agriculture monitoring practices. The objective of this training is to provide you already refresh the basics of optical remote sensing, explain what are the main characteristics of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data, you will learn the basics of radiometric indices and biophysical variables and its usage in agriculture. We will also introduce you to the main feature of ISA SNAP software and explain how to use SNAP software to pre-process Sentinel-2 data and how to calculate radiometric indices and biophysical variables that can be used, for example, in crop monitoring. Optical satellites and instruments are passive sensors. It means that they collect information and measure radiation which originates from the external source, which in this case is the sun. The part of radiation that is collected by the sensor is the radiation which has been reflected from their surface. Part of this radiation is also scattered by the atmosphere. It does not even reach their surface. Human eye is also a kind of remote sensing sensor 
which collects information only in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Using remote sensing uh, um, sensors, for example on board of satellites, we are able to extend the spectrum and collect information in the extended range, for example visible to near infrared, short wave infrared, but also in thermal infrared. This part of the spectrum is unfortunately largely affected by the atmosphere and clouds, which are blocking the radiation by scattered from the object on the Earth's surface. So it's important that the satellite system takes into account effect of the atmosphere and for example in data processing uh, we are able to remove or compensate some of these effects. For this reason we need to pre-process the optical data to account for the atmospheric effects we need to apply atmospheric correction to take into account gases and particles present in the atmosphere that can affect the incoming radiation and we need to compensate this effect. Optical data preprocessing include also cloud detection and cloud removal algorithm. Other preprocessing steps that may be needed uh, to apply are the reprojection, resampling and co-registration. A large portion of the Earth's surface is covered by clouds. Consequently, most Earth observation images in the visible spectral domain include a significant uh, amount of cloudy pixels. An image pixel can be cloud-free, partially cloudy or totally cloudy. Cloud detection methods can be categorized in the following classes spectral threshold methods, feature extraction and classification, learning algorithm, multi-temporal analysis and multi-sensor approach. Before radiation used for remote sensing reached the Earth's surface, it has to travel through some distance of the Earth's atmosphere. Particles and gases in the atmosphere can affect the incoming lights and radiation. We have scattering and absorption effects. Scattering occurs when particles or large gas molecules present in the atmosphere interact with and cause the electromagnetic radiation to be redirected from its original path. Absorption causes molecules in the atmosphere to absorb energy at various wavelengths. For further analysis, we want to use a surface reflectance product in order to allow comparison between images, allow repeatable measurements and repeat a known uh, physical unit. For this reason, to retrieve surface reflectance, we need to add back the component uh, lost in the atmosphere. The other preprocessing steps are reprojection. When you work with satellite images coming from different satellites, you need maybe to reproject because maybe they don't have the same coordinate system. So, for example, Sentinel 2 images are in UTM WGS84, but if you want to project Sentinel 2 images in Google Earth, you need to uh, reproject them to Geographic Latlon WGS84. Resampling may be needed uh, when you are using the data from different sources with different spatial resolution. And in order to overlap them correctly and work with the stack of data, you need to resample your images to the reference one. And further step could be the co-registration, which is very useful to perfectly overlap images and maximize the geolocation accuracy in time series analysis. In fact, one pixel shift can affect drastically your results.
Why use time series? A time series is defined as a set of satellite images taken over the same area of interest at different time, and it can make use of different satellite sources to obtain a larger data series with a short time interval. Time series of satellite observation offer opportunities for understanding how Earth is changing, for determining the causes of these changes, and for predicting future changes. Now I would like to show you a great example of optical high resolution satellite which is Sentinel-2 Copernicus Optical High Resolution Mission, which is used for monitoring land and coastal regions. It is a multispectral instrument, which means that it registers incoming radiation in multiple spectral bands. We have 13 bands, 4 bands at 10 meters resolution, the blue, green, red and near-infrared. We have six bands at 20 meter resolution, two bands in shortwave infrared, three bands in the red edge between red and near infrared, and after we have narrow band in the near infrared. On top of it, we have three bands at 60 meters, and these bands are mainly used for atmospheric and cirrus correction. If you compare Sentinel-2 to Landsat, the difference is bands that Sentinel-2 operate in uh, red age, but we miss the thermal bands which are present in Landsat. The special resolution that in Landsat is 30 meters, and the revisit time that is 16 days for Landsat and 5 days at the equator for Sentinel-2 with two satellites, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B that are in the same orbit. Here we can see the map of Sentinel-2 coverage, so practically you see that the, we have all land and coastal area covered by uh, Sentinel-2 systematic image acquisition, and even the, the islands. We have two levels of Sentinel-2 product, level 1C and level 2A distributed by 100 km by 100 km granules, which are the minimum indivisible parts of the product. These products are distributed free of charge, in free and open mode, through Copernicus OpenHS Hub. Level 1C is the top of atmosphere reflectance in cartographic geometry, and Level 2A is the bottom of atmosphere reflectances in cartographic geometry. So, the Sentinel-2 Level 2 data are atmospherically corrected. The atmospheric correction is performed by using a processor called Sentucor. This processor is the one used in the ESA payload data ground segment, but it's also available for the users. The Sentucor is distributed via STEP, the Scientific Toolbox Exploitation Platform, we will talk about it more in detail later. And it can be used as plugin in SNAP software or via command line a standalone tool. The output of Sentucore is the bottom of atmosphere reflectances in cartographic geometry, but also we have as output a scene classification map that contains basic land cover layers, uh, including clouds. We have water vapor map and aerosol optical thickness map. Apart from sent to core, Sentinel-2 data can be atmospherically corrected using other different processors depending on your application. For instance, we have Maya developed jointly by SESBIO, CNES and DLR, a Layer C developed by NASA i uh, developed by Vito, Cora, uh, developed by Brockman Consult, and many others. Here are the examples for Level 1C and Level 2A data. 
On the left you see the level 1C product, the top of atmosphere products, and on the right you have the atmospherically corrected level 2A data. You can see on the left the RGB natural color combination for level 1C and on the right the same RGB combination for level 2A after the atmospheric correction. You have also, as mentioned before, the SINS classification map, the water vapor map and the aerosol optical thickness map. Sentinel-2 data can be uh, used for various applications like land cover classification, agriculture and forest, vegetation monitoring, water quality, uh, coastal zone and bathymetry, uh, regional to urban application, geology and many others. In this video, we have the Sentinel-2 time series over a thin water kloof dam that showed the change in the water level between 2017 and 2018. The white line represents the initial water level and the red line the final water level. Here we have uh, the Landsat time series from 1984 till 2018 showing the deforestation of the Rondonian region. Now let's go a bit deeper into data processing and how multispectral data can be used to monitor vegetation and crops. One of the main methods used for monitoring vegetation but also soil water are radiometric indices. The radiometric indices are quantitative measures of features that are obtained directly by remote sensing data by combining several spectral bands. The most common radiometric index is Normalized Different Vegetation Index, NDVI, that is calculated using the equation presented here from near infrared band and red band. Because this index uses red and near infrared bands, it exploits in particular information about the vitality of the vegetation on the earth's surface. It uses the fact that chlorophyll present in healthy vegetation uh, reflects largely near infrared radiation. In the image here presented, you see the example of calculated NDVI. The highest NDVI is represented in green for healthy and very vital vegetation, and lowest in blue. Another radiometric index that can be calculated from Sentinel-2 data and is useful to monitor crop and vegetation status is the Sentinel-2 Red Age Position Index, which is based on linear interpolation. It is sensitive both to chlorophyll, a crop chlorophyll content and nitrogen content, and it can provide valuable information about crop and crop growth status. If you want to retrieve information about physical features of canopy, we can use so-called biophysical variables. The biophysical variables are not derived directly from remote sensing data, but auxiliary information are needed. There are several of them 
but the ones which are more important for crops are for example leaf area index, FAPAR, fractional vegetation cover, chlorophyll content in the leaf and canopy water content. In the second part of the webinar we will show how to retrieve these variables using ESA SNAP software. In this figure you can see which biophysical variables can be used for monitoring certain features of crops. For instance, for monitoring phenology, as a first choice you will use leaf area index. And a secondary measure you uh, could use also FAPAR and FACOVA to complete information. The same if you want to see the impact of pests on crops, you also use the leaf area index. The biophysical variables and radiometric indices can be also uh, derived from other optical data, even at coarse resolution. And for example, if you intend to extend your study to regional scale, you must find a compromise between the resolution and the area that you want to cover. In this case, you can, for example, use the data from another Copernicus mission, which is Sentinel-3. It is the ocean and land mission jointly operated by ESA and UMESAT to deliver operational observation services both for land, managed by ESA, and ocean managed by Humansat. The spacecraft carries four instruments: ocean and all sea color instrument, sea and land surface temperature instrument, SAR radar altimeter, and microwave radiometer. We have two Sentinel-3 satellites in the same orbit, separated by 180 degree. To provide better coverage. The SWAT width for Orshi is 1270 km and the spatial resolution of 300 m for full resolution and 1.2 km for reduced resolution. For SLSTR we have dual view SWAT. We have another view for which the SWAT width is uh, uh, 1420 kilometers and uh, uh, 740 kilometers for oblique view. Sentinel-3 satellite is on the polar sun synchronous orbit and with the overpass at 10 o'clock. The OLCHI level 2 land reduced or full resolution products are output from the OLCHI uh, level 2 processor and contain land and atmospheric geophysical products at full and reduced resolutions. We have, for example, OLCHI global vegetation index, terrestrial chlorophyll index, water vapor, and this is directly provided to the user. So in this case, you don't have to process the data to retrieve index, which can be um, used to estimate chlorophyll content in the vegetation. But instead, it's directly provided to the users. Now, after this short optical remote sensing refresher, we would like to present the ESA-SNAP software, which can be uh, very useful to process optical imagery, but on not, not only optical, even radar and thermal data. SNAP is an acronym for Sentinel Application Platform, even if it can be used not only for Sentinel, but also for the data coming from other satellites. The software is free and open source, built in common Java framework 
In Snap, it's also possible to include your own Python plugins apart from the functionalities already provided in the software. It has an intuitive graphical user interface. There is uh, an online help with many tutorials and, and uh, even very active forum where you can discuss with other users and also with uh, Snap developers. It is possible to download Snap software freely from step.isa.int. Here we have some statistics. Recently, uh, Snap exceeded 800,000 downloads, counted since June 2015. On STEP, we have more than 1,300,000 visit sessions uh, since June 2015. STEP is the ESA community platform where you can access the software, download documentation and communicate with developers and expert users. SNAP can be also uh, used to process submission data, for example Sentinel-1 data. We have in the software all main functionalities to process such data, both detected and complex data. We have tools for interferometry, PS INSA together with thumbs and polarimetry. The main functionalities related to high resolution optical data, apart from readers for Sentinel-2, or other satellites like Pleiad, Landsat and many others. As I mentioned before, we have atmospheric correction processor, level 2B biophysical processor to retrieve, for example, Lifera index. We have reflectance to radiance processor and we have three families of radiometric indices. There is IDPIX processor for pixel classification and this is very useful to detect uh, and mask clouds. Concerning medium resolution optical and thermal data, the main functionalities are visualizing spectrum of pixel, pixel extraction tools, uh, specific Sentinel-3 and MVSAT uh, sensor processors, optical water type classification based on the atmospherically corrected reflectances. We have also IDPX processor and in the next months we will have many more uh, new features related to optical medium resolution and thermal data. In this slide you can find a lot of important links, step website where you can download SNAP free and open, SNAP user forum where you can discuss with other users and SNAP developers, Copernicus uh, open access hub user for download uh, of Sentinel data. The last two links are related to the ESA Advanced Lab Training course focused on agriculture that we were organizing in uh, 2019. You can find here a lot of good materials, uh, lectures and exercises. The last link is the link to one of the presentation of Marie Weiss where she was presenting concepts and methods for Lifaria Index, F-Cover, FAPAR and Chlorophyll Retriever. In our next presentation, we will have Sentinel-2 Practical Exercise Demo, where we will show you how to pre-process Sentinel-2 data. We are going to resample the data. Sentinel-2 has multi-resolution bands, so the resampling is needed if the user wishes to combine bands with different spatial resolutions. 
we will show you how to subset the data. As we said before, Sentinel-2 data are distributed in tiles, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers, or two images in UTM-WGS-84. So the subset is needed uh, if the area of interest covers a portion of Sentinel-2 scene, or if only some bands are needed in processing. This can significantly reduce computation time in the, in the next steps. We will show you how to retrieve radiometric indices and biophysical variables. We will also present Graph Builder and how to build and use a graph with your processing chain. The batch processor will run your graph for a set of product and at the end we will use the time series tool to analyze the trend and dynamics of radiometric indices and biophysical variables. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Before I will briefly introduce myself, my name is Amalia Castro Gomez. I am working giving support as a, pro as a remote sensing project scientist to the education activities of uh, ESA, of the European Space Agency. I am a colleague of Fabrizio Ramoino, so I'm presenting this practical on his behalf. Now, if you do not already have uh, this data, or if we go at a pace that uh, you are not able to follow along, don't worry. We will have this recording up on the training webpage within 24 hours for you to go through at your own pace. Welcome to everybody to the second part of the webinar focused on the introduction to the ESA SNAP software and how to use it to pre-process and process Sentinel-2 data. The goal is to retrieve biophysical variables and radiometric indices for vegetation monitoring. SNAP is the acronym for Sentinel Application Platform, but as already said before, it is a multi-mission free and open source software. In fact, we have a lot of readers dedicated to optical sensors, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, but also it's a third-party mission and commercial satellite and we have also readers dedicated to SAR sensors. We have Sentinel-1, Heritage ESA missions like Envisat ASAR, ERS-12, and third-party missions as ALOS, Pulsar, and Cosmos SkyMed. Okay, let's go open the Sentinel-2 product, import optical sensor, sensor Sentinel-2 uh, L2A. We select the metadata file, XML, and click on Import Product. From the name of the product, we can get some information, like which satellite acquired the image, that in this case is Sentinel-2B, which processing level, and in this case is level 2A. We have the date and the time of the acquisition, and after the Sentinel-2 tile ID that identifies the tile of Sentinel-2, which are 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers in UTM VGS 84 CRS. Let's go into the file. We have metadata information. We double click on it and we can observe that we have general information product information, geometric ones, and many other information related to the product and even about the processing. We have uh, the Sentinel-2 band. We have here the Sentinel-2 band. In L2A, we do not have the band 10 because it is used only for atmospheric correction for purposes and it is in the output of the L2A processor sent to core. We have the 10 meter bands that are the bands 2, 3, 4 and uh, 8. 
we have uh, the 20 meter bands that are the red edge bands, five, six, and seven. The narrow band in the near infrared, band 8A, and two sphere bands, band 11 and 12, that are very sensitive to, to hot surfaces. And at the end of the product, we have the scene classification map, a set of masks reporting basic land cover layers, like uh, vegetated, uh, no vegetated, water and snow and ice. But it also contains masks related to the cloud shadow, clouds, thin clouds, classified pixels, um, no data pixels and saturated pixels as well. So you can use this information to detect and remove no usable pixels, uh, the ones that you do not want to have in the image. Now we can open the product and select the product, right click on the product name and open the RGB image window. We have different RGB image combinations for Sentinel-2, but please do not forget that if you want to combine different bands coming from Sentinel-2, um, they have to be at the same spatial resolution. In this case, we take the natural colors RGB combination. Red is band four, green is band three, and blue is band two. Okay, this uh, is a Sentinel-2 product. It is 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. On the bottom right of the screen, we have the pixel position, X and Y. And on the right, uh, the coordinates lat long of each pixel. On the left, uh, on the left uh, screen, we have the navigation window where we can move the visualized window. We have the color manipulation tool. Using it, we can stretch the histogram of the data. And after we have the world view that shows the footprint of the open product. And in this case, we selected a product over the north east of Italy. After this, I will show you some tools. We have the analysis tools. So relative uh, plot, uh, scatter plot, profile plot, histogram statistics. We have a layer manager and an edit vector manager. Uh, raster functionalities such as band math. And using it, the user can edit his own equation and create a new band in the product. We have DM tools. We have a geometric where there are some pre-processing tools like reprojection, uh, resampling, co-registration, collocation. It is a tool that allows the users to create a stack. I will show you how to use this tool to create a stack between, uh, uh, sorry, with the Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data, taking as reference Sentinel-2 uh, images and uh, Sentinel-3 will, will be the slave. We have a mask uh, tool, a data conversion, image analysis classification processors, such as unsupervised classification and supervised classification with the most common classifiers, segmentation processor and uh, the export processor. Here we have the tools and the functionalities dedicated to optical processors for Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data, the pre-processing tools uh, and the, the thematic 
land processing. This is a biophysical processor to retrieve uh, biophysical variables from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. Three, uh, three families of radiometric indices for soil, water, and vegetation. And uh, for, for this one, we have the NDVI, DVI, Sentinel-2 Rep, and many others. An AT processor to estimate the evapotranspiration from uh, Sentinel 2 and Sentinel 3 data. Forest cover change processors. We also have tools for uh, radar. Or inter interferometry and other star applications. And under tools, we have the graph builder. Uh, used to generate and to build your own processing chain, to run it on a single image, or using batch processing tool to run it on a stack of images. We have the plugin. the plugin manager to manage and install all the available plugins for SNAP, including your own one. And at the end, we have uh, the window. Here, on the right part of your screen, we have the product library. Using it, you can download directly the data. There are several repositories from where to download the data, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Then a layer manager, using it, you can, you can import your layers just clicking on the plus sign. And as you can see, several data formats are allowed. S3 shape file, RGB image from file. In the mask manager here, you have all the masks included in the product. And you can create your mask clicking on the function icon, fx, and uh, edit your expression. OK, let's go to the first uh, step of uh, pre-processing, the resampling. As said before, in Sentinel-2, we have bands at a different spatial resolution. And if you want to combine them, you need to resample. Raster geometric resampling. And we start to set up the module. Here we have our input and the resampling parameters. If you do not know how to use these parameters for each of the SNAP modules, we have the help in which you can find a brief description of the algorithm of the tool. And for some of them, you will find how to set up the parameters. We have three options to resample the product. They are explained here. Um, so by reference band, we take a spatial resolution, the resolution of the reference band. If you want to resample at 10 meters, you have to select uh, or band 2 or band 3 uh, or band 4 or band 8. By target width and the height. By pixel resolution, here we insert 10 meters. And after, you can define the upsampling method. 
we live nearest. We do not save the output in order to save time. The default output format for SNAP is the BIM DMAP. And then we, we can click on Run. The product has been created and it is open on Product Explorer window with the same name of the input, but with resampled at the end. So the next step is to reproject the raster geometric reprojection. We unselect save. In the reprojection parameters, we have a lot of CRS. The one of Sentinel-2 is UTM VGS-84. In this case, we want to reproject uh, the Sentinel-2 data in geographic lat long VGS-84 and preserve the resolution. So we run, and uh, the new product appears in the Product Explorer window. Okay, now the next uh, step is to subset to subset uh, the product. So raster, subset, and we have the window where you can resize the subset uh, of the product. You can or you can subset defining the pixel coordinates or the geo coordinates. In this case, uh, we we resize the product using pixel coordinates creating a product of 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. So X uh, is uh, from 3,000 to 4,000. And Y from 5,000 to 6,000. Additionally, you can decide to resize also the number of bands of your product if you do not need all of them. In this case, I select all, and then I run. Okay, this is the subset. And as done before, we right-click on the product. We open uh, RGB window. Uh, for red, we use band 4, G band 3, and uh, G meaning green. And B, blue, we select band 2, and then OK. And this is the newly generated product. We right click on the image, and then we can export uh, the view as Google Earth KMZ file. You can select the destination folder and the product name and then open it on Google Earth in order to see how how accurate is the Sentinel-2 geolocation compared with the VHR images of Google Earth. So we open now the KMZ in Google Earth. Here we are in Google Earth opening the product, and we see it is very accurate. So the geolocation is very, is very accurate as we can see. Okay, so we can we can then close Google Earth and we will be back to Snap. Okay, now I want to show you how to use the band math tool. In raster band math, the first thing to do is to define the name of the new band. 
we call it NDVI. And after that, we edit the expression. The expression for NDVI, as shown during the first part of the webinar, is defined as near minus red, and all that divided by near plus red. So in this case, it will be band 8 minus band 4 divided by band 8 again plus band 4. Okay, so we can run. And um, this is our NDVI band. Using the color manipulation tool, we can stretch the histogram, uh, the minimum to zero blue and the maximum one green. The min, the min, the, the minimum, uh, the medium one to 0 0.5, which is orange. Splitting our screen, we can uh, observe that for water and bare soil, we have low values of NDVI. So water and bare soil, low values. But over vegetation, we have high values of NDVI. Low values will correspond to blue, high values to green. To retrieve uh, biophysical variables, we go to optical, thematic land processing, biophysical processor. We have two dedicated processors for Sentinel-2 and one for Landsat-8. We can co compute the uh, LAI, uh, FAPAR, and FVC. I do not run it because on my laptop it takes almost 10 minutes. It uses lookup table in order to retrieve biophysical variables. Now I will show you how to build our processing chain using Graph Builder. So for that, we will go to Tools in the top menu. and to Graph Builder, which is also available from this top icon. So by default, you have two initial blocks, read and write. We right click on the dashboard, and there you can add all the modules of SNAP. The first one will be resampling. And afterwards, we will add reproject, then subset, then band map, then biophysical processor and then uh, band, band maths again. Sorry, band merge, I mean. 
So with band merge, we will merge the original bands with the new crea newly created ones. And at the end, we need to link all the blocks in the graph with the red arrows. Once created the, the graph, we have to we have to verify the parameters. We have to set it up. So in the read, we put the original Sentinel-2 product. Then in resample, we uh, configure with 10 meters uh, nearest neighbor. For subset, um, we have uh, all the bands, and we uh, set the x from 3,000 to 4,000, and y to from 5,000 to 6,000, as done before. And the same for band maps, we create the MDVI band and uh, with the same formula as before. Okay, and um, then we select LAI, PAPAR, and FVC for biophysical processor with Sentinel to be at 10 meters. So I do not run the graph uh, right now because it takes more or less five minutes to complete on my laptop. So we save the graph in XML format in order to import the to import it later on in the batch processing tool, which will allow us to apply it to our processing chain, sorry, to apply our processing chain to the, to the stack of images. For the time being, we just save this graph and we will apply it later. So let's close all the products that we do not need for clarity. And we go to tools batch processing. As you can see, we clicked on the plus sign, selecting more than one Sentinel-2 image. And uh, then we press OK. Here we have the list of imported Sentinel-2 data from June to August 2020. And we are going to load our graph that we just say. After loading, you see that on top of the list of products, we have now all the modules configured before. Project, subset, band mask. So it would be enough to click on run, and this would apply our graph to all the Sentinel-2 stack. I have already run it uh, for you, and now I'm going to open the pre-processed Sentinel-2 stack of seven Sentinel-2 images. So I, yeah, I'm going to show you the outputs of running this graph on this stack of images. Here we have our stack of seven Sentinel-2 images that again go from June until August 2020. And um, all the images have been subset over the same area. They contain the same spectral band. We will open one image in RGB natural color combination. 
And as already said at the beginning of the second part of the webinar, in SNAP we have dedicated tools for image analysis. We have the profile plot drawing line uh, where we get the profile of the selected band. For example, band four, band five, or, or band eight. As you can see, I'm doing it for band four. And I get the profile of that band. You can also get the profile of the newly calculated bands, LAI or NDVI. And uh, you can use the region of interest, ROI map. After that, we have the scatter plots. You can select uh, the same or different bands, even over different products over the whole image. Or you can select the ROI, the region of interest. If you select RI, it will be calculated over the geometry drawn earlier. You will get less samples, but uh, the trend more or less is similar to the to the previous one. We can use the scatter, we can calculate the scatter plot for the NDVI coming from two different products, three and four. And we have as well the histogram. If we select a band, for example, band four, it will give us the frequency of the pixels for each value of uh, band four. Even in this case, you can upload your geometry obtaining less samples in the plot. To change the displayed band, it is enough to click on the desired band to show. You see, I just click on band 8 and it's updated. All the plots can be saved as image or printed. Okay, let's now go to the geometry. Sorry, let's now go to remove the geometry through the layer manager. Selecting the layer and clicking on the minus icon, we can do this. And uh, to add a new layer, we go to the layer manager, we click on plus, the plus icon, and we select the format of our layer shapefile, RGB image from file. In this case, I will display a shapefile containing the field boundaries. So selecting the layer, you can upload it and then you can play with the transparency of the layer.
And to remove it, we do the same as before with the minus icon. On Snap, we also have the Mask Manager. And in here, you can create your own masks. For instance, you can take the calculated NDVI and mask all the pixels that have values lower than 0.6. You can click on the function, fx, creating a new mask. Uh, based on a logical band mass expression. You can select NDVI inferior to 0 0.6 as an expression. And as an output, all the pixels whose values are lower than 0 0.6 are going to be masked. We can change the color of the or the transparency of our mask. It is also possible to transfer your mask to all the products in the stack, clicking on transfer the selected masks to other products. And then selecting the products, the mask will be exported to. And to remove a mask, it is enough to to select the mask and then click on remove the selected mask. Okay, now I will show you how to use the time series analysis tool. I have already opened it, but by default it is not visualized. So you go on view, which is in the top part. then tool windows, radar, and time series. To add our Sentinel-2 uh, our Sentinel two stack, we click on the upper right icon, settings, and uh, on the add open, which opens all the products already open in Snap. So we can click apply and we can select the band to display we select NDVI and uh, then we will select show cursor position here. So that when you move your mouse, you will get the value of NDVI over that pixel where your mouse is. We can observe that over urban areas, the NDVI values are close to zero. For bare soil, it is not, not uh, zero, but it is low. And uh, when you move to vegetated areas, the value of NDVI goes up. If you have uh, a peak uh, going down in a very localized way and only over one image, maybe there was a cloudy pixel.
Now we will change the band. We will select LAI. And even in this case, where you do not have vegetation, the LAI is very low. And then over vegetaria, vegetated areas, it goes up. Okay, we can select also the original band, band 4 and band 8, which if you remember were used to calculate NDVI. And add in the NDVI band series on top of the plot we have NDVI. In the middle, we will have band 8. And now in a minute, in the bottom, we will have band 4. The reason for doing this, which you will see now, is that we can see the trend of the NDVI is similar to the one of band eight. On top, we have NDVI, in the middle, band 8, and in the bottom, band 4. And the trend of the NDVI is similar to the one of band 8. So in the second part of this webinar, I have shown you how to pre-process Sentinel-2 data with resample, reproject, and subset. We have seen how to retrieve biophysical variables and radiometric indices using the ESA SNAP software at 10 meters resolution. In some case, the user wants to extend the analysis at regional, continental, or, or global scale. So you can continue to use Sentinel-2 data, but it is quite difficult because your processing chain can be affected by several issues. For example, the revisit time of Sentinel-2 is five days with two satellites. But in some parts of the world, for long periods, you can have clouds and optical sensors cannot retrieve information. In this case, you need more frequent acquisitions but uh, in the other hand, it seems uh, sorry, it means a coarser resolution. A satellite that can be used in this case is Copernicus Sentinel-3. As already said before, it has 300 meters of spatial resolution, but it has almost a daily revisit time with the two uh, with the two satellites, Sentinel-3A and Sentinel-3B. In Sentinel-3, we have OLCHI, Ocean and Land Color Instrument, with a wide swath at 300 meters spatial resolution. And this could represent a good compromise if you want to do a global analysis, even because to process and to store Sentinel-2 data is not so easy in terms of the cost and the computation time. So the next step of this exercise is the collocation of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data. I have already pre-processed Sentinel-3 data, meaning reproject and subset. So we will open Sentinel-3 OLT level 2 full resolution products acquired on the same day. So Sentinel-2 at 10 a.m. 
and Sentinel-3 was at 9.30 a.m. We close the product that we do not need anymore. inside the Sentinel-3 product. We have the Sentinel-3 spectral band, 21 of them, and also some radiometric index already calculated at the ESA PDGS, so OGBI, OPDCI. We are going to use the Sentinel-3 OGBI and compare it with the calculated NDVI for Sentinel-2. So opening the Sentinel-3 or GBI, and then we will manipulate the colors. We stretch the value, and for the minimum value, we select the color blue, for the middle one, orange, and for the biggest one, the maximum, green, which matches what we did for NDVI. And we can observe that the spatial resolution is quite different from the one of Sentinel-2 NDVI. In fact, if we open Sentinel-2 NDVI, it is easy to see the difference. In our case, we're going to improve the OLT level 2 of GBI using Sentinel-2 data as a reference. So we select uh, the raster tool. And in geometric, we have the collocation module. It appears on the screen, and we select the master image. This means the product that will be taken as reference. In our case, it is the Sentinel-2 image. And as a so-called slave image, we select Sentinel-3 all C level 2 product. I already renamed the output to Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3 collocation. I suggest you do that too. And uh, the output band will be renamed automatically with the original names followed by underscore M 
for the master's band and underscore s for the slave's band. For resampling method, we select bilinear interpolation resampling. If you have some doubt, you can always consult the help where you can find a brief description of the algorithm and how to set up the parameters. So as usual, we do not save the product because it takes a few minutes to save it and we do not want to lose time now. So we just click on run. And this little error that appears, don't worry, it's because it was an old product. So we upload it again, we upload the product again, and then we click run. And now it runs. So now on Snap, the new product is open, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3 collocation, with the bands coming from Sentinel-2 with underscore M, and after we have the bands that come from Sentinel-3 with underscore S. Now we will open the NDVI from Sentinel-2 and the OGVI from Sentinel-3. First, we close what we already had. And like I said, we open the NDVI from Sentinel-2, which is the master, and the OGVI from Sentinel-3. We manipulate the colors to homogenize the visualization of uh, the two of them. So that they can look similar, they can look comparable. And you can observe that we increased the quality of the Sentinel-3 product resampling. We did take in as reference Sentinel-2. Indeed, we open the Sentinel-2 and DVI on the top, the original Sentinel-3 or GVI, which is at the bottom, and the resample Sentinel-3 or GVI, which is in the middle, and it is possible to distinguish the shape of the field. Now, this represents a good compromise if you want to extend your analysis at global scale if you do not have a lot of resources. In many ESA projects, we use Sentinel-3 data at global scale, for example, in the medium resolution global uh, climate change initiative land cover map. That's what we do. We have also the climate change initiative high resolution land cover map, but it is not global. It covers three big regions, meaning uh, the Sahel region in Africa, Siberia, and the Amazon. Another project called uh, ISA World Cover has the, the final product, which will be released in October 2021. And this is a high resolution land cover global map taken as input Sentinel 1 and Sentinel 2 data. The output will be at 10 meter resolution with 11 land cover classes and an overall accuracy of 75%. This product will be available to the public, free and open to everyone, and will be distributed by ISA without any cost or any registration. 
it will be distributed in three degrees by three degrees time. So this will be an excellent example of high resolution land cover map at global scale. But as I already mentioned before, if you want to monitor crops, you maybe would need more than one acquisition per month to catch the, the crop cycle. So with this, I finished my exercise and this webinar, hoping that I fulfilled all your doubts. And if you have any questions or requests for clarification, please report them in the Q&A box and we will answer as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention, for your attention and goodbye. Thank you, Amalia, for a wonderful demonstration on how to process Sentinel imagery using SNAP software. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact information for Fabrizio Ramuinho and Magdalena Fitrick, along with links to the training webpage and the, Europe and the European Space Agency's EO for Society website. Thank you. It's wonderful to see so many great questions coming in. We do appreciate everybody that's taken the time to ask them. Uh, there have been some really good ones. So what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll read each question. And then for any of the guest presenters that are on, uh, maybe Amalia, Georgia, or Fabrizio, if you wanted to unmute yourselves and then answer, uh, we will have somebody transcribing. So if, you're not, if you have not already answered the question, uh, somebody will be uh, transcribing as you, as you answer. So question number one, why do different bands in Sentinel-2 have different resolutions? So the question is that, uh, sorry, the answer is that this is due to a combination of reasons. On one hand, we have um, user requirements, and on the other hand, data transmission and storage issues. Because you see, the amount of data generated by Sentinel-2, uh, by both satellites, is huge, around 1.6 terabytes of data per orbit. So this needs to be managed. And we have, um, no, sorry, so uh, images that have higher spatial resolution, they take up more space. So the objective was to um, optimize this by giving a higher spatial resolution to those bands whose applications need it, such as agricultural bands, to level 2A via SNAP. So the answer is that yes, we are using the sen core processor as a SNAP plugin. Linear interpolation of cross image losses sharpness compared to um, nearest neighbor, it's a pro or a con. So in terms of image visualization, it's a pro because you don't see the original pixel shape. But if you want to perform a time series analysis, it's a con because it's going to modify the data interpolating them, interpolating the pixels. How can we best analyze use Sentinel-2 and DVI time series point data without being biased in removing the data affected by cloud? So our answer is that on one hand, we assume that sharp decreases followed by a sharp increase constitute a very cloudy measurement. But of course, there remain thin clouds, which will cause a less abrupt decrease and so they may remain in your series after you do the cloud removal. But on the other hand, you don't want to over remove measurements because you would be losing important information. So the answer is try to find a compromise where the end result still looks realistic based on the pattern of devel development of your crop because pixels with a bit of clouds are still valuable. Okay, for question five, in which application area is the bottom of atmosphere data? 
uh, used and why. So the bottom of atmosphere data are used if you intend to allow comparison between images, to allow repeatable measurement, for example, ground spectra comparison to satellite observation, and to represent a known physical unit. Okay, question six. During atmospheric corrections or cloud masking removal pr process, do we lose mathematical information or critical data for Sentinel product? Can we really get insights when cloud coverage is above 60 or 70 percent or mask the cloud to get valuable information? So the answer is that yes, you can get Sentinel-2 data with 60 or 70 cloud coverage and get the valuable information mask in the clouds. This is needed when you have to analyze an area covered often by clouds. Okay, so question seven. What is the range of NDVI for vegetation at different growth stages? So Fabrizio tells us that the NDVI goes from zero to one. Values above 0 0.6 indicate that uh, the vegetation is healthy. Question eight. Why didn't Santucor give me back the band eight near of the Sentinel-2? In Google Earth Engine, the images atmospherically corrected don't have the band eight. Why? So uh, Fabrizio's answer is that if you process the Sentinel-2 data using Sentucor at 10 meter resolution, you will have as output all the 10 meter bands at uh, 10 meters, all the 10 meter bands except band 8 because you have the band 8A at 20 meters, plus all the 20 meter bands at 20 meters, and all the bands except band 8 and band 10 will come at 60 meters resolution. So maybe in Google Earth Engine, they take band 8A, avoiding band 8 to save time and uh, space. Okay, let's go with question nine. The person is asking, how do I isolate the LAI for a particular crop? For example, wheat, when the low uh, vegetation uh, sorry, from the low vegetation LAI data. The low vegetation LAI data could also include grass LAI, right? And uh, yeah, so and uh, Fabrizio is uh, wrote an answer that you need in situ measures to classify and distinguish different crops or to discriminate crop from vegetation. Uh, he points out that Sophie Bonton from the University of uh, Catholic University of uh, Louvain will clarify this doubt during the webinar of the 19th of October. The webinar is called by a physical variable retrieval using optical imagery to support agriculture monitoring practices. Okay, so we can go with question 10. The question is, what are the VIs that can be used to estimate the ecosystem respiration and how confident are such retrievals? So the answer um, Fabrizio and Magda give us is that maybe you can estimate evapotranspiration. On SNAP, you can install an external plugin called SENET and uh, they leave us uh, the link there. Then we have question 11. How can I calculate the LAI using Sentinel-2 or Landsat-8? Okay, so uh, again, Fabrizio and Magdalena say on SNAP, we have a processor called L2B processor, which was shown during the demo. Um, and it's useful to retrieve LAI from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. Question 12 now. Is there a way to correlate Sentinel-2 bands with Sentinel-3 bands, knowing the big difference in resolution? So the answer is yes. During the demo, um, uh, Fabrizio and I were showing how to do it on SNAP. The tool was called 
collocation and it relies on geolocation of the satellite. It means uh, no co-registration was applied. Right, so uh, question 13. Can we use Sentinel-3 products for agriculture monitoring? And um, the answer is yes. If you have to analyze a large area and you do not care about high resolution, you can use Sentinel-3 at 300 meters spatial resolution. You will have almost daily acquisitions and uh, you do not have to wait for a five days revisit time. Now question um, 14. Where can one find all the indices for all the kinds of crops or other agricultural yields? I mean in a list and understand how they can calculate, uh, sorry, how those indices are calculated. So uh, again, Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that uh, on SNAP we have several indices, but uh, on the literature you can find a lot, uh, who uh, also will tell you about the equation, the algorithm needed, and uh, how to implement it on your processing chain. Next question, 15. Can SNAP be used as a replacement of common remote sensing GIS softwares like RGIS, AirDAS, uh, etc.? And the answer is that SNAP is an open and free software. So it was not born to replace commercial software. It is very useful to pre-process and to process remote sensing data. But uh, for complex analysis, you have to move on to RGIS, uh, QGIS, etc. Next question 16. If one uses the LAI index for phenology, nitrogen or disease uh, assessment at the same time, how does one pinpoint each phenomenon using LAI or do you need to do multivariate analysis using a combination of indices? Um, right, so Fabrizio was saying that uh, Sophie Bonton will elaborate, elaborate a bit on this topic during the webinar of the 19th. Uh, yeah, so you can learn more then in her webinar. Next question 17. Uh, is the atmospheric correction different using different Centucor versions? Um, if yes, should I only download L1C files and apply the same correction for all? Right, so the answer is that no different versions of Centucor are related to different Sentinel-2 data formats. So anyways, you can download Sentinel-2 L2A data directly from the Copernicus Open Access Hub. And uh, there is the link for you. OK, question 18. Can you recommend a document or website listing the characteristics and purposes of each radiometric index? Uh, I want to have a general view to choose the suitable index for the study area analysis, like the soil salinity analysis. Uh, yes, then again, for this question, we point you to the webinar of Sophie Bonton. She will elaborate more on this topic, so you can really, yeah, we encourage you to follow it to learn more. Exactly, part five. So question 19, is there a Python package or wrapper for SNAP? So Magda, Magdalena and Fabrizio tell us that Snapista is a GPT wrapper for Python. And its goal is to provide an easy and a Pythonic way to provide, sorry, to write and run Snap graphs, but using Python. So we leave uh, the link to the documentation and also to the installation guide. And next, we move on to question 20. 
can you still derive the radiometric indices in SNAP even if you downloaded the Sentinel-2 data from Google Earth Engine? And the answer is yes, because you will have the possibility to select the input band to retrieve indices. Okay, question 21. With the SNAP readers or other sensors, does the data have to be in a specific format? For example, when we import the Sentinel-2 images, we can import it as a zipped file directly downloaded from the Copernicus website. It doesn't, however, read the Sentinel-2 image as well, if, uh, sorry, as well as if it is downloaded from NASA's Earth Explorer website. So, for example, if I want to import a Landsat 8 image, how would this be imported? Okay, yes, so uh, Fabrizio and Magdalena were saying that in SNAP, you will in fact find several readers which are dedicated to various uh, satellite data, so optical, thermal, radar, star, and then generic format. So the best is if you use those uh, dedicated readers to import the specific data set from the specific sensor that you are using. Next uh, question 22. Can we create a time series of a variable like LAI from multiple images at the point location using SNAP? So the answer is yes, definitely, because as you saw in the practical of today, you can use the time series analysis tool uh, of SNAP. Yeah, so you would need your stack of data and then with this tool you can visualize the time series. Then we reach question 23. Are level 2A products already pre-processed with Sentucor? And uh, the answer from uh, Fabrizio and Magdalena is that yes, but several atmospheric processors are available to process Sentinel-2 data. So Sentucor is the one used in uh, the ESA payload data ground segment. So question 24, can you please elaborate on how shapefiles are used to process Sentinel data in SNAP? So the thing is that shapefiles are not used to process Sentinel-2 data in SNAP. You can import those shapefiles in SNAP using the layer manager tool and then you use them as a complement for your, your purpose. But those shapefiles themselves, they do not they are not used to process the Sentinel data. Um, yeah. But anyways, if by processing you meant including them in your workflow, you can do this with the, the layer manager tool. And then from there, you carry on working. So question 25, uh, why did you resample band 2, 10 meters, to 10 meters? So. Uh, Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that was because the resampling is applied to all the bands included in the Sentinel-2 product. So if the bands are already at 10 meters, it doesn't matter, they will just not be changed. Okay, question 26. What is uh, the accuracy of SNAP in LAI retrieval? for different vegetation types, such as agriculture, forest, and grassland. So uh, again, Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that the LAI, LAI has been developed by Indra, so the accuracy is uh, the one of that processor. Okay, question 27. In the graph builder that was created, it is not clear what band mass was applied in the second band mass component after the biophysical data was generated. So in fact, it was not a band mass, it was a band merge, where we were merging the input bands of Sentinel-2 with uh, the MDVI and uh, the biophysical variables. Hope this clarifies. All right, question uh, 28. What happens if the image is not 
co-registered. So Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that if you want to work with time series, but you don't want to co-register or co-locate images from the stack, uh, you need to rely on the accuracy of geo-information provided inside the product. And then question 29, what tools and practices should be used when creating mosaics of Sentinel-2 data? How to achieve best uh, band value consistency across different mosaic components? Well, um, atmospheric correction is needed. And if you want to have a nice mosaic coming from different acquisitions in time, you can create a cloud mask to remove clouds and the specific equations to replace cloudy pixels. And uh, here, Fabrizio and Magdalena leave a link to uh, a paper where you can learn more about it. And uh, then question 30. Is it possible in the histogram to overlay an ROI on the entire image histogram. It would be useful to be able to see where your ROI fits in the, um, sorry, over the entire image. So the answer is that um, at the moment, no, it is not possible, but uh, Fabrizio and Magdanella signal that they will take on board this suggestion for the future development of SNAP. So for now, you can compare two histograms, one for a full image, and then uh, add the ROI mask. So question 31, is it possible to see the R2 Pearson coefficient in scatter plot in SNAP? I never got it. So the answer is that you can display the regression line with related equation and R2 in, in a correlative plot in SNAP by going to uh, analysis and uh, in there you have correlative plot. Then question, question 32. By analyzing a field with LAI, which values tell me uh, that uh, the crops are less impacted or more impacted by uh, pests? Yeah, again, so for this question, uh, we refer you to the webinar of uh, Sophie Bonton, which will happen on 19 of October, part uh, five of this series, because she will talk about biophysical variable retrieval, sorry, retrieval, and then you can learn more there. Right, question 33, if I want to perform field analysis, how many biophysical parameters would be enough, for example, F cover plus LAI plus chlorophyll, or should I use all for each field? Yes, <laughs> interesting question. So the same, we point you to the webinar of Sophie Bonton because uh, she will tell us more, but at least you could use LAI, N uh, sorry, NDVI, Sentinel-2 Red Edge position as well. But uh, don't miss out that webinar if you are interested. So question 34, how can we make sure that uh, the drop in NDVI in time series is coming from the vegetation state and not from other factors? Right, so Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that you are right and that maybe uh, the pixel is cloudy, but you can recognize it in the next acquisition of the time series and uh, you can remove that pixel from your analysis. So for this reason, atmospheric, uh, atmospheric correction and cloud removal are needed before you, you move on to properly analyze your time series. So we reach question uh, 35 which says, how are the biophysical parameters in SNAP retrieved? For example, LAI or FAPAR? And what is their quality, precision, reliability? 
any limitations in applying them in certain geographical areas? Yeah, so similarly as before, um, the answer is that the LAI has been developed by Indra, so the accuracy is the one of that processor. And then question 36, how can I select my NDVI threshold to be sure that it is vegetation? So Magdalena and Fabrizio tell us that values of 0 0.1 and below correspond to barren areas of uh, rock, uh, sand, snow, or artificial objects whereas moderate values represent shrubs or uh, sparse vegetation. These would be values going from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Uh, yeah, while high values indicate healthy vegetation. So healthy vegetation would be going from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. And the next question is how to validate the biophysical parameters such as LAI? And the answer is that you can validate your results through in situ measurements of LAI in selected plots along trans transects randomly selected per field using LICOR 2000, uh, 2200 plant canopy analyzer. In question 38, can I use Sentinel-3 for crop, uh, crop classification? Yes, of course, you can use it at coarser resolution, which would be 300 meters. And by the way, Sophie Bonton also talks about this in her webinar of uh, the 19th of October. Yes, <laughs> thank you for including it. Question uh, 39, what steps should be taken for sloped terrain? The answer is that you should use a dedicated high resolution DEM for those areas for terrain correction. And question 40, the person is asking how often should we obtain imagery? I know the answer depends. <laughs> cloud cover is not an issue in arid areas, semi-cloud cover and tropical areas where there is consistent cloud cover that may require SAR. So Magdalena and Fabrizio are telling us that, uh, yes, indeed, you should be uh, using SAR for crop monitoring, where your issue has to do with cloud cover. And uh, Sophie Bonton will also talk to us about this in uh, her webinar. This is great. A lot of questions of people interested. We hope you will be able to come okay. to the next one. Okay, now we go question 41. Would it be possible to get a better resolution on thermal band in Sentinel-3 using a similar approach as the explanation for NDVI? And Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that yes, but just in terms of visualization because the information will be interpolated from the original pixels. And then question 42. Is it possible to use the processed images from the clouds in all analysis, such as classification? Um, so we were having trouble understanding the question. Well, it, if the question is whether you can use the outputs of clouds that are atmospherically corrected for classifying crops, then yes, sure. I mean, yes. 
as you can have, as you will have learned during this session. But otherwise, let us know and then we can answer further. Question 43, are there any other atmospheric correction algorithms or methods similar to CentoCore within SNAP, like FLASH or DOS? So Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that in SNAP, we can also use iCore from Vito. And then they point you to the SNAP website and especially to the forum where they highlighted a particular uh, thread discussion thread about this, so you can learn from it or you can engage in discussion with them there. And question 44, how can we mosaic a large area easily, such as a district or a state? And the answer is that you can use SNAP or you can use the Sentinel-2 global mosaic service. And uh, they pasted the website there for you. Right, question 45. What is a GVI and how is it calculated? Is it cloud free? I will need to go down because I cannot see the screen now. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> so answer, yeah. Here we are. So the answer is that OGVI is uh, OLCI's Global Vegetation Index. So you can have a look at the FAQ for the technical guide because you can learn a lot more about it there. It will give you a good overview and a good starting point. Next question, 46. Is it possible to say resampling for data coming from different sources? And the answer we get from Fabrizio Magdalena is that yes, but you should co-register them, meaning resampling them to a unique sp spatial resolution. Next question, 47. Is there a link available to the upcoming ISA global land cover map based on Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2? And uh, my colleagues tell us that, yes, there is. This is a world cover, and there is the link there for you. There will be a webinar on, 20, on the 20th of October. So we hope uh, you can attend. Next question, 48. How would, rate, uh, how would you rate SNAP against other softwares? <laughs> So my colleagues uh, answered that it is a, a very powerful, so SNAP is a very powerful software in terms of the new algorithms implementation, especially for data pre-processing. And also SNAP um, supports most of the main Earth observation missions, optical and SAR. And it is also open source, which means that you can use it uh, also through Python as well as create your own plugins. So they say that the, right, the rating is quite high. Then question 49, can you please provide more information on CentuAgri, which is well beyond the scope of this course? Yes, and my colleagues answer that the CentuAgri system is an operational standalone processing system which uh, generates agricultural products from Sentinel-2 both A and B, and from Landsat 8 time series along the growing season. So, for example, monthly cloud-free composite of a surface reflectance at 10 or 20 meter resolution, or monthly cloud-free composites of a surface reflectance at 10 and 20 meter resolution, or monthly dynamic cropland masks, cultivated crop type maps, at 10 meter resolution for main crop groups and periodic vegetation status maps and DVI and LAI. And more information can be found on the website of Centuagri. And uh, they mentioned that you can inquire more about it to Sophie Bonton, which again will be one of the speakers uh, in our webinar of the 19th of October. And in fact, I will add that Sophie has a dedicated section at the end of her presentation about Centuagri. 
and not only as well as Central Agri, she will also talk about other projects. So by all means, if you are interested in Central Agri, definitely, definitely uh, come to her session. Next question 50. Can you give the link to the global land use maps you mentioned? Yes, and this is this is again ISA World Cover. And my colleagues uh, tell us that there will be a webinar on the 20th of October. So you are welcome to join. Right, so we go with question 51. What is the use of super resolution and what is the accuracy? Yeah, so uh, Magdalena Fabrizio tell us that super resolution is a resampling module which is dedicated to Sentinel-2. So you can learn more about it in, in, the, in the details of that module. Okay, question 52. Can we save time series as data files, CSV, etc., from SNAP? And the answer is that, yes, you can save results from a time series analysis in a text file. And export it, yes. Okay, question 53. Is it possible to pan sharpen, pan sharpen Sentinel-3 with Sentinel-2? My colleagues answer that, in theory, yes, but we do not have this tool on SNAP. So the closest uh, operator that would help you is the collocation operator, the collocation operator of SNAP. OK, then question 54, can you please provide guidance on using um, uh, snap features through a line command and uh, my colleagues let us know that yes you can find some tutorials on the uh, on the snap website or as well on the isa's uh, eo for society website which is uh, the the website where we post the materials of our trainings of our isa trainings so, for, for example, they give you the links to two of them. One has to do with a GPT intro, and the other one is titled Bulk Processing with GPT. Okay, question 55. Are VIIRS and Sentinel-3 providing the same kind of images, spatial, spectral, and time resolutions? And my colleagues tell us that yes, but Sentinel-3 for optical has a spatial resolution of 300 meters, uh, thermal at 500 meters and 1,000 meters. Next question, 56. What is the temporal resolution of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3? And the answer is that the satellite in the Sentinel-2 constellation provide a revisit time of five days at the equator in cloud-free conditions. So that means uh, with one satellite, you would have a revisit time of 10 days at the equator. For Sentinel-3, there is more or less one day of revisit time for the two satellites. Then uh, question 57, what if Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 images have different dates? Is it still okay to improve Sentinel-3, to improve a Sentinel-3 and DVI image? And my colleagues tell us that yes, because we use Sentinel-2 as a master just to improve the spatial resolution. Right, next, uh, question 58. Can we generate evapotranspiration using Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data at a 10 meter resolution? And my colleagues tell us that yes, you can do this with a SNAP plugin that is called SENET. 
and to, to use this plugin you can uh, read uh, uh, the help uh, function about it so you know how to use it question 59 which one is more efficient and accurate doing the demonstration exercise using google earth engine or using procedures in snap right so my colleagues tell us that um, if you want to present some analysis using time series, of course, Google Earth Engine is more efficient. However, if we want to explain details about data processing, sorry, pre-processing, for example, uh, or for SAR data, it is much more efficient to show it in SNAP because SAR data in Google Earth Engine are already pre-processed. So complementary use, really. Question 60, is there any way using SNAP, uh, of using SNAP to remove the clouds that cover the land? Sorry, I'm back. So is there any way of using SNAP to remove the clouds that cover the land? And the answer is that yes, you can create a mask and you can use it as an input of band mask to remove the cloudy pixels. Next question 61. Is it better to use band 3, 4, uh, 8 and 8 for agriculture or all bands? The answer from my colleagues is that all the bands, especially the bands in red, red edge and near. So bands four to band eight are the ones you should be using. And question 62, can SNAP be used to run any machine learning, deep learning classification algorithms? The answer is that in SNAP we have some classificator, for example, random forest, and uh, my colleagues tell us that uh, there are plans to improve the list of classification algorithms in the near future. And I will just mention that uh, the webinar of this series, part four of this webinar, run by our colleagues of Rus Copernicus, will uh, use a random forest and a support vector machine for classification of a crop. So yeah, we encourage you to come to that webinar. Again, webinar on part four to learn a bit more about it. And now question 63, can we calculate the biophysical parameters using a band math tool in SNAP or maybe outside SNAP like Google Earth Engine or other GIS software? And the answer is that no, you need the uh, lookup table included in the level 2b processor developed by INRA. Yeah, so you would, uh, yeah. Okay, we are reaching now question 64. Is it possible to import a shape file sampling point? and then use it for a supervised classification directly without employing pin manager or creating the training sample itself via SNAP. Yeah, that's interesting. My colleagues say that for the moment it is not possible, but they will write down your suggestion to, for future improvements of SNAP. And question 65, 65. Would it be possible, would it also, oh, sorry, would it be also possible to get a better resolution on thermal band in Sentinel-3 using a similar approach as the explanation for NDVI? Okay, my colleagues point you to the answer uh, 57. So if you later on when this document is published, when you look up this, this uh, transcript, you can see what answer 57 actually is. Right, question 66. 
I did not understand the use of bottom of atmosphere data. Example, if I want to use an image with the bottom of atmospheric correction for processing both identification, will it be better than another image with the top of atmospheric correction? Right, so my colleagues say that no, for this topic, you can use also Sentinel-2 top of atmosphere data. So you can use both for this topic. <laughs> right, question 67. Um, how to create a mosaic in SNAP? Uh, what use for pixel uh, generalization, median, mean? Uh -huh. So my colleagues say that this depends actually on your purpose and that if you do, if you look in literature, you can find what the right method is for your application. Okay, then question 68. The question is, can we correlate NDVI and S2RED? When? Is it appropriate to use S2 red? Okay, so my colleagues tell us that in fact NDVI is dedicated to vegetation. So, uh, whereas SE rep is focused on crop, so on agriculture. Probably then mean a C rep instead of S2 red. Maybe that's a typo. Okay, then question 69. The question is, if I select only the bands, band two, band four, etc., when subsetting the product, are the Sen2 core masks lost? Do I have to use Sen2 core again on the subsetted image? Uh -huh. And the answer is that no, you wouldn't be losing them because the mask, are not subsetted. Only the bands are subsetted. So this means that when you are subsetting, you have the option of uh, removing some of the bands if you do not need them, but the masks, they stay anyways. You cannot remove them with the subset. And then we go question 70. Which data, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, is more reliable for crop monitoring in the rainy season? Okay, so um, Fabrizio and Magdalena tell us that Sentinel-1 data can be used because SAR data is not affected by clouds. However, the SAR signal is in general sensitive to the dielectric properties, so it can be tricky. Again, it depends a bit on your application. Okay, next we have question 71. Is there a way in SNAP to download a bulk of images like a Python script? And my colleagues tell us that there are some scripts and you can also access a full archive through some platforms, also Amazon, for example. And besides that, you can also use the Sentinel Hub API, and they leave uh, for you the link there. So you can investigate that. And it looks like we are reaching the end. The last question is question 72. Can we use the image after removing the cloud for further analysis, for example, classification? because the pixel value will not be real after the cloud is removed. Right, and my colleagues uh, tell us that yes, you can create a mask and you can use it as input of band mass uh, to remove the cloudy pixels. Okay, great. Amalia, that was, that was amazing. You did such a, a terrific job. Thank you for, for answering and as well for uh, Magdalena and Fabrizio for, for answering all of these questions. Uh, I apologize, there, I seen there was some audio issue at the beginning of the Q&A session where you could not hear me, but it seems like we have resolved that issue. So uh, again, Amalia, just a, a tremendous job. Thank you so much. And, and to the rest of the team, 
uh, from for, from ESA for uh, for filling these in and for for being guest presenters and presenting such amazing demonstrations and presentations uh, throughout today's training. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everybody that asked questions. Uh, it certainly there was a lot of interest, judging from uh, judging from uh, Fabrizio and Amalia's presentation uh, today, uh, this morning and this afternoon. Uh, just judging from these questions, uh, we can see a lot of a lot of technical questions, a lot of theoretical questions. So it's really great to to hear that from the user community. Uh, some of the uh, some of the interests and the applications that they're most interested in. So again, big thanks. Uh, I want to as we as we close out today's webinar, uh, we do want to say that uh, in uh, in next week, next Tuesday, we'll be having part three of this webinar series. So we do hope that you will uh, continue with this five part webinar series. Uh, we're very excited for everybody that's been joining so far. Uh, big thanks to Amalia Gomez. Uh, for doing such an amazing presentation, for handling the question and answer session so well. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we also uh, want to acknowledge uh, Fabrizio Armino uh, for presenting and also for helping out with the, uh, the question and answer session as well. Really just a, a great presentation by him, as well as uh, Magdalena Fitrick. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining today and helping out in answering all of these great questions that we've had from our presenters. We also want to thank uh, Georgia Karadimu for, for joining as well and, and, and providing support and doing everything you've been doing. And a big uh, acknowledgement to the RSET team, uh, that's Erica Podest, Amita Mekta, uh, Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, and Jonathan O'Brien. They've been behind the scenes setting up this webinar and making it run smoothly. So a big thanks to for the RSET team. And the biggest thanks of all to everybody that joined today. Uh, thank you, we appreciate your time, we appreciate your interest in this topic, and we really hope that uh, the a uh, lot of the skills that you're able to learn uh, to process, pre-process, and then also uh, start preparing to do some of the uh, the analysis that uh, that you're hoping getting as much as you can from this webinar series. We appreciate you joining us today. We hope that you're all staying safe, and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for part three of the webinar series. So thank you to everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.